set our motivation. everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, before I go into those ones that we haven't covered, did you have some just general impressions of this whole premise of Maitreya's analogies about Buddha nature, what is concealed, what conceals, this just this whole premise? Um, how is it going? It's, it's a bit poetic, weird, what? <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, you okay. um, I, I hope I can uh, explain myself uh, right, but I had that, like this feeling with all these uh, analogies that you need like to take out all kinds of stuff, bad stuff, so you can uh, get to a very, very pure and good core. And it seemed like the core has like this nuclear that it's semi, -ob not objective, but real or true. And I, I felt that it, it's contradicting the fact that Buddha nature itself is also uh, empty of inherent existence. So? Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly the sort of doubt that you should have. <laughs> that's exactly the doubt. Because um, it is, it's sort of like saying, in the center of the mess is lack of mess, in the center of the mess is the real you or the authentic self, you know, if we're being Oprah. Um, but, you know, like at the center of it all is something findable. And um, that is very much how it sounds. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, these are from Maitreya via a Sangha, right? These are from a Buddha. This isn't like some subsequent scholar who's like coming up with fancy ways to describe Buddha nature. This is coming from a Buddha um, and from um, an incredible meditator that was able to access that Buddha. So it's very intriguing to me, these analogies, for sure. And, um, you know, what they're, what they're sort of talking about with each of the concealers with each of the messes, you know, with each of the disturbances is a specific type of covering, you know, related to a specific level of obscuration. And what they're talking about at the center, the concealed, is, is usually something that um, in, in the physical world is very related to us and is showing us the quality of Buddha nature that we need to understand how it is. Yeah, we need to understand that Buddha nature is something that is like gold that um, can't have dirt get into it even when it's dirty. You know, like we have a generic concept of that in the world. You know, you see a big lump of gold, it can be covered with dirt, but you know you can wash it off and the dirt didn't get inside. You know, you know that there can be this like crazy swarm of bees but there is this beautiful pure honey and it doesn't have like dead bees stuck in it and it doesn't have dirt in it and it's just always pure and amazing and sweet. And they're, they're like relatable images to human beings that we've seen. You know, that we've seen and there's, so it immediately makes 
an impression in the mind, um, but it also can lead to the wrong impression. Yeah, it can lead to the wrong impression. So, so we're not at all saying that the self is inherently existent or that Buddha nature is inherently existent. There is an aspect of Buddha nature which is permanent. Which is not to say it's inherently existent, but there is one part of Buddha nature that, that never changes. Do you remember? We talked about it at the beginning of the semester, but quite quickly. Yeah, there's one aspect, right? There's the four Buddha bodies that a fully enlightened being has. One of those is the result of a permanent aspect of the mind. If we're talking about permanent things in general, what are the usual examples we give of those cases of things that are permanent? Because one of them is space, uncompounded space. One of them is emptiness, right? Emptiness is permanent, but what the thing is empty of is impermanent, right? So you have like the book, the book is impermanent, but the emptiness of the book is permanent, right? So what it's referring to and its emptiness, one is one and one is the other. So the permanent nature of Buddha nature is the emptiness of the mind. Its lack of inherent existence is a permanent phenomena that when the rest of the mind is fully developed, means that that portion becomes what's called the svabhavikakaya, the nature truth body, or like the natural Buddha body. Then there's three other bodies, right? There's another dharmakaya, which is the jhana dharmakaya, which is having gotten rid of this habit of grasping at inherent existence and is like your own nirvana. Yeah, your own nirvana. So your own state without suffering, right? And it's, you know, it's your place of peace. And then there's the two form bodies, which come from the method side of the path, right? Which come from practicing compassion and kindness and patience and all the kind of tangible good things. And those two Buddha bodies are coming from an impermanent place, right? They're coming from a developmental place. And so you have the, um, the Sambhogakaya, the enjoyment body of the Buddha, which is for highly developed practitioners to access. And then there's the Nirmanakaya, which all beings can access and can take any form, any form that sentient beings can relate to. So a Nirmanakaya aspect could then take the form of a dog, it could take the form of a bridge, it could take the form of a book, it could take the form of anything. And um, anything that's going to help move your mind towards transformation. Right, so, you know, of these four Buddha bodies, they're all mental bodies, generally speaking. Yeah, they're all mental bodies, generally speaking, but one little corner of it is permanent. Yeah, and so that can really easily make us think if it's permanent, it's inherently existent, but there's not that relationship. If it's permanent, it still depends upon parts. It still depends upon um, the mind's imputation. It still depends upon a valid basis. It just doesn't depend on causes and conditions in the same way as impermanent things do. Yeah. So yes, yeah, certainly these analogies can lead to the wrong idea. Um, I think one of the the most common ones that will come up in other places is the sprout or the, um, the skin um, covering a fruit or the skin covering a seed. It's kind of like you've got a little seed and then when it sprouts and it bursts through the skin of the seed, the sprout eventually gets to a point where there is no seed left. So where it came from is starting to finish as soon as the result is started. And that's kind of the way things go in our development, right? As, as the cause decreases, the result increases in this kind of like rather than in a like sudden, you know, it's like as one finishes, the other begins. Like the scales of justice, <laughs> right? Right. So, then, yeah, interesting. Yeah, you're, you I thought also about the analogy of the bees and the honey. I thought that they are uh, angry because they uh, feel the honey is their honey. So when we speak about uh, the honey as a symbol of Buddha nature, it's not our Buddha nature because 
then we would be angry if someone want to take it from us. It, it's, uh, we are part of it. The honey is uh, the world's honey or the Buddha nature is all around. Then we wouldn't be angry if uh, uh, we are not attached to something that is our honey. That's, yeah, that's a nice way. That's a nice way of looking at it. I like that. I mean, the, you know, the reason they chose honey for that one was the taste. You know, the, everything is one taste in emptiness. Um, there's, there's all sorts of poetry about emptiness that can help us understand it or help us get more confused, depending on where your head's at. But to say everything is one taste, sweet, <laughs> to say that in emptiness there is no coming and going. Right? In emptiness there is no coming and going. In emptiness there is no good or bad. Eee, danger, right? In emptiness there is no good or bad. In emptiness, there is no beginning or end, right? Because it all depends on blah, 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 right? So, um, so to say in emptiness, everything is one taste. It's, um, it's a very interesting just thing to sit with. You know, in the Zen tradition, they use Zen koans, you know, like what is the sound of one hand clapping if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it? Does it make a sound? You know, Zen koans, you guys know about Zen koans, yeah, the classics. Um, so all of those are just like a simple statement to make you understand dependent arising and then understand emptiness. You know, so similarly, in emptiness, everything is one taste, could be like the Tibetan Buddhist Zen koan, yeah. Because if you were to sit with like, okay, what is the sound of one hand clapping? You would, you would say, huh, all right, well, there be a clap. There needs to be an interaction. There needs to be this, there needs to be that. There needs to be someone to hear it. There needs to be a labeling of sound. There needs to be this and this and this and this. And you realize dependent and arising of sound. And then you realize that in the middle of sound, there is no core sound maker, you know? Like if you were to play a guitar, where is the sound coming from? Is it coming from the strings or is it coming from the space in the box? Or is it coming from this? Or is it the interaction in the ear? Or, right, it's all of it together. So by sitting with these like very simple poetic statements, it can help you access the kind of technical list definitions scholarly side. It actually can help you understand that side and they can be mutually beneficial. Yeah, because some people have a more visual, a more poetic way of looking at the world. Some people have a more literal, concrete, logical way of looking at the world. And all of us have a little bit of both. And so we can kind of use this, these things to work together. Because in your next semester with Venerable Amy, you're gonna be going into more technical emptiness stuff. So if you can kind of take a bit of the poetry with you, it will make it more fun. It'll make it less um, dry. Although I don't think she'll teach in a dry way at all. I was checking her out on YouTube and she's a very fun teacher. But the topic itself, tenants, you're really splitting the hairs of the different subtleties between the different schools of thought. And so um, sometimes it can help to bring in a bit of poetry to keep it alive for you. Yeah, and some people get annoyed with the poetry and they're like, just get to the point, right? <laughs> so, depends on maybe how much sleep you've had that day, I don't know. But, yeah, um, other impressions from the, from the meditation or from the, the premise before we unpack um, the rest of the analogies? Some of what they refer to we've studied in depth and some of what it's referring to you haven't studied as much or at all. Um, you know, like the desire form in formless realms maybe hasn't come up yet. Um, grounds and paths we've just kind of touched. So some of the things that the analogies refer to um, might not be as clear yet, um, but it's kind of placing these terms in your mind in some sort of context, which hopefully will come in handy down the track. So the skin of the fruit, which will split when it sprouts, is like breaking through the acquired afflictions that we abandon on the path of seeing. So there's the innate obscurations and there's the intellectually acquired obscurations, remember? So we have like grasping at inherent existence, which has caused all sorts of obscurations over time. But then we have intellectually acquired ones. 
from views that we've learned as a human being. You know, we might have a view that, I don't know, a blood sacrifice at midnight will lead to liberation. That would be a wrong view, right? We might have a view like that. So the analogy that we're down um, to number six, the skin of the fruit. So these are, um, this is related to the acquired afflictions, the intellectually acquired afflictions that you break through on the path of seeing, which leads to a sprout or a tree with fruit that develops the fruit of enlightenment. Yeah, the fruit of enlightenment. And this um, is related to the transforming Buddha essence that can become the wisdom dharmakaya, right? The above one was related to the nature dharmakaya, the swabhavikakaya. This one's related to the jhana dharmakaya, your own liberation, your own nirvana. So transforming Buddha essence um, is sometimes called adventitious purity, is also sometimes called the Buddha nature to be developed, right? So there's a few different translation choices for, the, for this transforming Buddha nature, transforming Buddha essence. The other one is the naturally abiding Buddha essence or the naturally abiding purity or the natural Buddha nature. Those are all synonymous as well. And I know it's frustrating to find different translation choices, but it's a struggle that all of us have to deal with. Even when English is your first language, it's easy to get thrown. So if you just kind of know, there are a lot of synonyms for these two types of Buddha nature. Um, and by reading the words and just thinking about them, you can probably tie into which is talking to which. But stop me if you get confused, okay? Um, and so it's saying ordinary beings who have entered a path, shravaka and solitary realizers, meaning hearers and solitary realizers, um, foundational vehicle practitioners, aryas who are not yet arhats. So this is talking about Hinayana arhats. Okay, so, so just kind of, you know, picture it. Picture the skin of a fruit bursting, the seeds bursting, and from it comes a sprout, comes a tree with many fruits. This is what happens when we break through all of the acquired afflictions. Yeah. And you know, this is something really liberating to think about that, that without the wrong things that we've learned, development is going to come a lot quicker. There's a lot of strange wrong views we have in our life. You know, we might have a, an excessive belief in, I don't know, astrology. We might have an excessive belief in a certain kind of diet. And they could be all things that are true in a certain context but we've taken them to be true in and of themselves. And, you know, and then we get lost in them and spend our whole life kind of obsessed with them and then miss out on the development that can come if we can let it go. So these are actually gotten rid of on the path of seeing. So you can kind of confront them as we are now, but you have, you know, little, we could call them tendencies of superstitions. Right? It doesn't seem like we're superstitious people, right? We might not think that it's bad luck if a black cat walks in front of us, right? We might not think that's superstitious, but we do have a lot of superstitions and tendencies towards superstitions. Even the fact that it's so easy for us to believe false news, you know, um, if it's coming from a friend that we trust, then we assume it's true. Or if it's coming from a news publication we trust, we assume it's true without actually any valid basis for assessing that. You know, it's very rare for us, I include myself in this, it's very rare for us to look at the news objectively and say, who is writing this and what is their agenda and what is their sources? You know, we don't usually read in that way. We just kind of read and believe. And, um, and that's a type of superstition. So just the tendency of that is something that sentient beings have. All of us have this tendency of superstitions. And it's something important to kind of be aware of and be on top of. But that tendency really gets cut off at the path of seeing when you realize emptiness directly. So that's good news. You burst through the veil or you burst through the skin of the fruit or the skin of the seed. Does that one make sense? Can you please uh, remind us what is Arya's who are not Arhats? So someone who has realized emptiness directly, but they have not yet finished their path. 
So an arhat in this context is someone who's achieved nirvana, so the end of a hinayana path or a foundational vehicle path. Arhat just means foe destroyer, foe being negative states of mind, etc., etc. So there are hinayana arhats and mahayana arhats. In this context, we're talking about um, foundational vehicle arhats. So they haven't yet finished. So they've achieved the path of seeing, but they haven't finished the path of meditation and the path of no more learning. Right? They still have a bit more to go. So this is a little bit of like introduction to grounds and paths. We've talked about grounds and paths a little bit. Path of accumulation, path of preparation, path of seeing, path of meditation, path of no more learning. We've, we've briefly kind of gone over it as it comes up and it'll keep coming up but it's basically the developmental stages or the cognitive shifts or the most significant realization points along the path of development into full enlightenment. So these guys aren't, um, aren't quite finished yet, but they're getting rid of those acquired afflictions, the intellectually acquired. So then the tattered rag to be, is um, to be thrown off, number seven. This tattered rag is to be thrown off, revealing a beautiful Buddha statue at its center. And this is the way we want to throw off the innate afflictions and their seeds. So previously we were breaking through the acquired. Now we're breaking, we're throwing off the innate and their seeds. Um, so these are the objects to be abandoned on the path of meditation. Okay, so um, this leads to the naturally pure Buddha essence that will uh, become the nature dharmakaya. And ordinary, and it's referring to ordinary paths who have entered a path um, learning aryas. So that's a grounds and paths conversation that we'll come back to. But what you're trying to really think of is the last veil, you know, or one of the, one of the last veils kind of being lifted and then the great reveal. So in previous analogies, it was talking about like a lump of gold that needed to be washed off. Now we're sort of saying there's a finished version, which is that naturally abiding potential already formed into a Buddha shape. Then the rag is taken off of it and it's revealed. Yeah. Does that one make sense? Oh, cool. Okay. Then um, number eight is referring to the, the womb of a destitute woman or a very, very poor person who is carrying in her womb a baby who will become a universal monarch. Um, so this is um, something that can happen if you have a huge amount of merit is that um, you're able to become like the king of the world. <laughs> yeah, or the king of universes or just have a lot of power and influence. And so, um, we are like someone who is carrying this amazing potentiality within us, but right now we feel like we're in poverty, right? We feel like we're in destitution. And so that, that destitution and that poverty is something that we leave behind when we become Buddhahood, when we become Buddhas, just like a baby leading a, leaving a poor family is leaving poverty behind. Now, of course, they might take their family with them. That's the friendly thing to do. But the analogy here is you're both the destitute woman and the baby, right? You're both, right? So you're carrying within you this baby full of this amazing amount of merit who will have lots of power. And their inheritance will be Buddhahood. So the womb of the destitute woman is re related to the afflictive obscurations, which are to be eliminated on the seven impure stages or bodhisattvas on the sense and impure grounds. So you realize emptiness, then the next path is the path of meditation. The path of meditation has 10 stages. The first seven are about afflictions and removing afflictions and their seeds. The last are about getting rid of anything that prevents full omniscience. Yeah, so the first seven, getting rid of afflictive obscurations, the last three, getting rid of cognitive obscurations, obscurations to omniscience. So there's a, a chart that we were going through at the beginning of the semester that had those things. So if you want to dig it up later, it might be useful. Um, but anyway, we'll keep coming back to these so don't get swamped. Okay, and so then the last one is um, a fine layer of clay dust or a clay mold that is covering a brand new gleaming Buddha statue inside of it. So if you've ever you know, seen the way pottery works, 
or some forms of pottery where there's the, the metal golden image within and then there's the clay surrounding it. And then once it's baked and then you break it apart and the golden shiny thing is revealed and you have to brush off any remaining dust so that you can see the way it's gleaming. And so this is related to the objects to be abandoned on the eighth, ninth and 10th stages, these cognitive obscurations that I mentioned. And the golden Buddha statue in this context, we're looking at the radiance, right? So, so picture it very, very shiny, like a mirror, and it reflects everything. The Buddha in essence that will bring forth the emanation body of a Buddha. So that which can, you know, radiate and benefit all sentient things. Okay. So these are these nine analogies. And, uh, you know, some of them make more sense than others, I'm guessing. And some of what they refer to makes more sense than others. But basically, if you can kind of just in your mind say the first three are talking about things that form and formless realm beings are getting rid of. Form and formless realm beings have achieved a very high level of concentration and they don't have manifest suffering, right? They don't have like the everyday painful suffering that we have, physical and mental, because of the power of their concentration. They have, you know, the suffering of um, all pervasive suffering of conditioning, right? But they don't have the everyday suffering. So they need to be really looking at the latencies that will give rise to those things in the future. Because just because they've got good concentration doesn't mean they've actually fixed anything. It's like they've put a lid on it, right? And all of the causes for suffering are just there as seeds in a jar. And eventually the merit it takes to have that level of concentration will wear off and all those same habits will pop right back up. So it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, have you heard of um, really, really charismatic cult leaders um, who seem to have some sort of clairvoyance and magical abilities? Like, I don't know, maybe Osho or something, you know? Um, or um, Jim Jones, or I don't know. There's so many cults, right? But maybe you've seen some cult documentaries. I used to be obsessed with cult documentaries when I was a kid and I found them so fascinating because it was like, why? Why would they all listen to him? Why? You know? And it's a little bit like if someone develops very strong concentration without bodhicitta, right? No bodhicitta, no wanting to be a benefit to all sentient beings, just relieving themselves of their own suffering and having a generally non-harmful attitude and general ethics, but their main point being, I want this blissful concentration. When they die, then their next rebirth, they have all of the merit of that concentration, right? They have all of the positive karma from all of that concentration. And so in this life, they might not have practiced or studied, but they have a bit of remaining clairvoyance. So they're able to see a little bit about the minds of others. It's a bit like they're hyper intuitive, right? So it's as if they can read minds, but they really can't. They're just like really, really intuitive. And so people feel like they're magic. Yeah, and so it's very easy to be sucked in. And because they've got all of this merit, also people are attracted to them. They have like magnetizing karma that makes people want to be with them and to feel happy to be with them, even though they might be an absolutely dodgy person with terrible ethics. Still people are like attracted to their charisma. Yeah, and so this is what can happen to us if we develop an amazing spiritual path without bodhicitta is that we can develop a certain level of abilities and a certain type of concentration, but then we forget about using it to benefit others. And then when the merit wears off, all of the afflictions come back out. Yeah, we didn't do anything to get rid of them. So it's just an interesting sort of food for thought, but that's what's being referred to in the first three, the lotus, the bees, and the husk. Yeah, that they're obscuring the truth body and the emptiness and the naturally pure Buddha essence. So then um, the next one, the filth, ordinary beings of the desire realm. This is, so the desire realm is the realm that we're in. We're in the desire realm and we experience manifest suffering. So that's why it's talking about the heap of filth is representing all the afflictions in their fully fledged, awakened, driving form. That's very obvious to all of us. 
So I'm just reviewing them now, yeah. Okay, so then the earth is um, related to the ground of the latencies of ignorance created by unpolluted karma. So the imprints of ignorance and um, it buries our naturally abiding Buddha essence like a buried treasure. Yeah, like a buried treasure. So this is real relating to hearers and solitary realizers. And then we've got um, more about hearers and solitary realizers, ordinary beings who've entered a path. And then just those last two that we just went over, those are talking about what's removed on the Bodhisattva grounds. So, um, so I was thinking it might be useful to do a little review of grounds and paths, just to kind of get those terms back in our minds. So if it's really familiar to you, it might be just you know boring, but I'm guessing that it's not familiar yet grounds and paths. Okay, so if we're talking about developmental stages, what's the first big developmental stage we talk about in Buddhism? Do you remember if, you know, you're sort of thinking about a significant shift from ordinary self-centeredness, ordinary ignorance, what's the first kind of big shifts that we talk about or big realizations? If you were to think about the three principal aspects of the path retreat that we did, it's two of those. <laughs> so the first thing that happens is that for you to achieve what's called a path, you need uncontrived renunciation. Um, yeah, someone's saying refuge. Absolutely, refuge is essential. Um, refuge is really essential, but it's not seen so much as a realization. It's more like a foundation or a platform to achieve realizations on the basis of. So, you know, really it should be on the list, but it's more like it's the basis to develop everything else. So definitely refuge is important. Recognizing your perfect human rebirth is important. Having a teacher is important. But the first kind of like big shift that your mind undergoes is the shift from being obsessed with the details of this life to being aware of the impact of future lives. Now, of course, we would say your future lives, but you can think in terms of the future life of humanity, right? How much bigger a person becomes when they're not just worried about themselves and their own little life and where this little life is gonna go, when they're actually thinking about the legacy that they're leaving behind them and the impact they have on humanity. Do you know there's, there's a huge shift in people when they start to consider their relationship to the world and their relationship to the future? You know, like what are the things that make people environmentally conscious? What are the things that make people socially aware? What are the things that make people not so immediate gratification oriented? You know, we would say these are things that are approaching renunciation, the determination to be free. Yeah. So to not be obsessed with, with your own life, you need renunciation, right? You need the determination to be free of the everyday suffering and its causes, which means looking at your attachment, you know, looking at your self-obsession and looking at your irritability and annoyance and looking at those things and being aware that the cause of your daily suffering is the habits within your own mind. And everything else is conditions, but the substantial cause is your own stuff, right? So the first developmental stage is renunciation. And for a Mahayana practitioner, that renunciation needs to be together with bodhicitta. Yeah. So not just looking for the future lives in a general way, or looking at future lives of your own mental continuum, but looking at that for the sake of all sentient beings, not just specific ones you like or those that you're related to, but all sentient beings. So the first path and grounds of paths is renunciation and bodhicitta uncontrived. Renunciation and bodhicitta uncontrived is called the path of accumulation because you're accumulating merit. You're accumulating momentum. You're building critical mass for the next realization. Yeah, so it's, you know, you're someone with 
the determination to be free from samsara, you're someone with beautiful altruism, and those are the main motivating forces in every aspect of your life, even if you're leading a totally ordinary life with ordinary details, you have these vast motivations, and that's how you orient yourself. And because of that, it builds a flow and a momentum that leads to the path of preparation. And to have the path of preparation, you need calm abiding, and special insight together. Yeah, so calm abiding, single pointed concentration on a virtuous object, special insight, the analytical ability to pierce into reality. So you need to have single pointedness and analysis united on emptiness. Conceptually, right? Conceptually, not perceptually. So when you can, you know, have a very steady mind and then bring in analysis and it doesn't disturb your single pointedness and it's focused on emptiness, that's the path of preparation. Yeah. Come abiding special insight conceptually on emptiness. Okay, so it's called the path of preparation because you're preparing to realize emptiness. You're preparing to realize emptiness perceptually. You've realized it conceptually. You're preparing to realize it perceptually. And the shift occurs mainly with repetition. Yeah, repetition and merit going back over and over your correct intellectual understanding, going back over and over your ability for single pointed concentration, which at this point is a beautiful flow and does not take much effort or any effort. So you're preparing to realize emptiness perceptually. And once you realize emptiness perceptually, that's what becomes the path of seeing. The shift will to personal. That's the shift. So just a note, sometimes the path of preparation is called the path of joining in some older translations. So if you see the path of joining, it's referring to the path of preparation. So, okay, so the path of seeing, this, this is the shortest path, okay? So the, the path of accumulation and the path of preparation could take any number of days, months, years, lives. Yeah, some people quick, some people long, it could take any number of, it, the time frame is, you know, not certain. It depends on how hard you work, basically. Um, but the path of seeing is basically one session. It's the session in which you shift from conceptual to perceptual. So once you've perceptually realized emptiness, you're just clearing negative karma, like a blowtorch clearing a forest, right? It's just amazing how much more quickly your path goes after this point. And the very next session that you meditate on emptiness perceptually is called the path of meditation. So basically the path of meditation really is that you're meditating on your perceptual realization of emptiness again and again and again, each time clearing eons of negative karma. They can no longer give you suffering. Yeah, question? Can you say again what is the path of seeing? I did. The path of seeing is the point at which you realize emptiness perceptually directly. And it's one session. It's the session in which that happens. And then the very next time you do that is the path of meditation. All right. So on the path of preparation, you were doing that same union of calm abiding and special insight on emptiness, but it was still conceptual, right? It was still something that you had to fabricate and think about and work your way into. But when it becomes, you know, spontaneous and in the flow and effortless and, you know, something far more powerful when it moves into the realm of perception, that's the path of seeing. That's when you become an Arya being. Right, an Arya being. Generally speaking, for Mahayana. Okay. So, what, what is the difference between the see, path of seeing and meditation? Oh, it's because you do you. It's not one session. You keep on meditating. Exactly. Yeah. So the path of meditation has what are called 10 grounds, basically 10 levels of obscurations that are removed, uh -huh. right? So you're doing the same meditation again and again. 
this same perceptual realization of emptiness, you again do it. You're meditating, emptiness appears to you, you get off your cushion, you live your life, things appear to be truly existent again. But you don't believe them because you've broken the spell, right? You've pierced the veil. It's not, you know, the drama of life is no longer believable. Just naturally, you don't have to stop and remember, it just isn't. So of course, once you've realized emptiness, and then once you move on to the path of meditation, you're not accumulating negative karma in the same way because you're not believing your own hype, right? You're not believing your stories, you're not believing all the illusions, so you're not causing trouble. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful and significant state. And as you're on the path of meditation, you know, little, little problems can still arise, little things can still happen, but it doesn't have nearly the same significance as it does for us at our level. And you're just clearing and clearing and clearing negative karma sequentially. And that's what's being referred to in these last two analogies, the womb of a destitute woman and the fine layer of clay dust. The womb of a destitute woman refers to what is removed on the first seven impure grounds, basically the first seven stages of the path of meditation. Are you with me? Yeah. So that's, that's that. And then the next one, the fine layer of clay, clay dust, is, what is, re is referring to what is removed on the pure grounds, the eighth, ninth, and tenth stage on the path of meditation. So at the end of that, you're a Buddha. And that's called the path of no more learning. So that's when you shift from path of meditation to path of no more learning, is when you get rid of all the final obscurations. So these, this is what we call the obscurations to omniscience, right? The cognitive obscurations. When those are removed, you're completely omniscient, you're a complete Buddha, and you're able to benefit everyone in an unmistaken way. So, so those five paths and um, the 10 grounds of the path of meditation, it's something that we do spend a lot of time talking about, but this is just a kind of quick and rough summary, quick and rough summary of the main, you know, transition points. And know that, you know, each of those paths have their own subdivisions and different criteria and things like that. And you might be interested to learn that or not, but just to have a rough idea of the five paths is, is really useful and important. And, um, and it comes up again and again. So um, I think, but what you're wanting to remember is that progress happens in stages. It's not like one day you're afflicted, the next day you're a Buddha right? That there's actually really significant transition points where you're a very different person. You're a very much happier person. You're, you have an expanded ability to benefit others. You're released from a level of neuroses, right? And this happens in stages over time. So whether it takes one month or 16 lives or three countless great eons, it kind of doesn't matter too much once you've begun because everything is going in this beautiful flow towards fulfilling your complete potential. The hard part is where we are because we haven't yet achieved a path, a pathway awareness. We haven't achieved uncontrived renunciation of Ovichita. So that means that we have progress and then we forget about a lot of things and we backslide, you know, and then we meet a path, practice a path, get distracted, backslide. So if we could practice well enough to achieve the first path, the path of accumulation, it would be so much easier to progress ever after. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, yeah. why, why, I know it's, um, it's in last uh, stages, but why last path, but why, why is it called the cognitive obscurations? No, I, I, what I, you would think that cognitive is something that's more in the outer or less you know, deep, connected, kind of more easy to remove, so. Yeah, it, it's, they're interesting word choices. I mean, it's cognitive obscurations as opposed to afflictive obscurations, right? So the other obscurations are afflicted, meaning the coverings and the, um, the yeah, I guess just the coverings or the concealment that comes from your habit of negative states of mind. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have the problems that come from your habits of negative states of mind. You get rid of those first, 
then what is left is the tendency of things to still appear that way. Mm -hmm. You know, so things still appear to be truly existent. You don't believe it, but you can't see otherwise. So they're cognitive obscurations because they prevent full omniscience, which is cognitive, you know. So the full expansiveness of your cognitive abilities, the full um, potential of your cognitive abilities is obscured by the imprints. Yeah. So that's why they use the word cognitive, because it's preventing the full cognitive ability of the mind. Um, and the afflictive obscurations, which sometimes are even called the emotional obscurations, they're seen as coarser. Yeah, they're seen as coarser. So those get, all of them get removed on the path of meditation. Yep, the first um, the seven grounds get rid of the afflictive, the rest get rid of the cognitive. And then Buddha, done, happy. <laughs> yeah, other, okay, so grounds and quests, paths questions? Mm -hmm. Anything to kind of clarify or any transition points that weren't clear? Okay, so this is, uh, there is four, four paths. The path of uh, preparation, accumulation, seeing, and meditation. There's five. Five paths. The last path is the path of no more learning, Buddhahood. Ah, okay. Thank you. A bit confused because you said that at the beginning is the path of accumulation. You need to have bodhicitta because I thought it's like the end goal. Bodhicitta is um, the desire for the goal. Yeah. So bodhicitta is um, a main mind. So if you remember seven types of awareness and minds and mental factors, bodhicitta in its fully fledged form is a main mind, not a mental factor. But it's, it, starts, um, it starts as a mental factor. So right now we have bodhicitta in a fabricated way. We think for the benefit of all sentient beings. And if you think that and believe that and are holding that, you have bodhicitta for a second. Right, you have a mental factor. But the repetition of that leads to that turning into a main mind. So it's uncontrived. So you don't have to like stop and think about it. You definitely always in your mind is, I want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Yeah, definitely all the time. You know, you're making your breakfast, you're cooking your tea, you're doing whatever, but you're thinking, I want to be enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, not necessarily in words but it just pervades everything. So bodhicitta um, is realized at the path of accumulation, not necessarily, right? To, to achieve the path of accumulation, you need renunciation. For us, we try to also have bodhicitta right from the outset, but you can actually achieve just renunciation and go a bit down the path and then develop bodhicitta later. That's fine too, yeah. Um, so some people practice in that way. So for a Theravadan practitioner, the five paths are described slightly differently. Yeah. But the emptiness that's realized is the same. Yeah, and um, the calm abiding and special insight developed are the same. What's different is the, the bodhicitta and how far they get on the path. So without bodhicitta, the farthest you can go is the seventh ground of the path of meditation. Yeah, so the seventh ground of the path of meditation is like nirvana, liberation. So you're not suffering anymore in, uh, in any way. And you're not causing any trouble, you're not hurting anyone. Yeah, not hurting anyone at all, um, not suffering at all, but you're not actively taking responsibility for the welfare of all sentient beings. And you're not able to fully enact their welfare because you still don't have complete omniscience. So you can get pretty far without bodhicitta, but for us, we want to start with bodhicitta. And you might even realize bodhicitta before you realize renunciation. You don't have a pathway awareness, but you have an incredibly powerful, compassionate mind. Yeah, so someone with bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva. 
And a bodhisattva is someone who is still practicing, right? They're not done yet with their path. But they could be any number of levels in this five path scenario. It's just once they achieve the fifth path, the path of no more learning, they change their branding <laughs> from bodhisattva to Buddha. Um, Dr. Alexander Burson calls the five paths, the five pathway awarenesses, which can kind of help you touch the meaning, right? Just like samsara is not a place, it's your state of mind. These paths are not external paths, they are internal pathway awarenesses, which is probably obvious, but just to kind of, you know, settle that into your mind. These are pathways. You know, it's, if you think in terms of brain, you know, you can think of brain pathways and all of that, you know, quite easily if you've studied even basic kind of neuroscience, the way different connections are made in the brain. And what is it that makes the brain create a new pathway usually is repetition, isn't it? Um, I think it's very interesting that a lot of rehabilitation programs are 28 days or 30 days, right? Like if you go into drug and alcohol rehab, they're often for about a month, right? And for us, most of our highest yoga tantra retreats take a month. And it's kind of like about a month of really focused attention on something is often enough time for a bit of a shift to happen if you have enough of the prerequisites. Right? If you've fulfilled enough of the preparation, 30 days is a, enough time to kind of get a bit of a shift happening. But if you go into a one month retreat or a one month rehab program without mentally being prepared or ready for it, it won't work. Right? Do you know what I mean? So it's interesting to kind of like look at the parallels of how long does it take to fundamentally change your mind? You know, and it might still be that at the end of 30 days of meditation, you are still a samsara addict, right? But um, you've recognized your addiction and you're managing it in a one day at a time sort of way. And it's not, you know, dominating your life and causing so much ill health the way it used to. So the addictive, the addictive uh, parallels are interesting to look at. How long does it take to change? How long does it take to develop calm abiding? perfect single pointed concentration. If you have the prerequisites, theoretically it only takes six months. Yeah, and it, yeah, but you know, one of the prerequisites is having little desire. So <laughs> that could be a life's work, right? Yeah. Or feeling safe, right? That could be a life's work. Yeah, but if you have the general prerequisites, you sit down and get the job done, six months done. So how long does it take to get from the path of accumulation all the way to the path of no more learning Buddhahood? It depends on what style of practice you do. It depends on the strength of your motivation. So for someone um, who is not a tantric practitioner, it's going to take possibly three countless great eons from the path of accumulation to Buddhahood. But three countless great eons is nothing compared to beginningless time. And once you achieve this path, you're very happy all the way. Yeah, you've got your troubles, but you've found your path. Life is rosy, you're a beneficial person, you're enjoying life to life to life. Hardships happen, you take them on the path. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, meaningful life. And you're not, after about halfway through the path of preparation, you never fall back to the lower realms. So you go from good rebirth to good rebirth to good rebirth all the way to the end. Yeah. If you practice Tantra, um, it said uh, you can achieve enlightenment in one life. Um, if you practice poorly, 16 lives. So 16 lives is still shorter than three countless great eons. <laughs> so that's quite nice. So it's worth, it's worth thinking about. But also, you know, it's a much shorter duration because it's a lot harder, but you know, it's efficient. So have a think. But a lot of people go into Tantra assuming that they'll become enlightened in one life and really push and push and push and push and push and they don't have enough kind of foundation like refuge and it doesn't work and then they're disappointed and give up on everything. So the essential preliminary is very much refuge. Yeah. Yeah, where do you, where is that place of safety? Where is that place of foundation and connection as well as connecting ability, 
You know, what is that within you that you take refuge in and gives you inner safety? What is your own integration and development and whatever cohesiveness words you would use? What is it that you tap back into to awaken your own sanity? Yeah, that's really essential. Yeah, also. I'm just thinking how, um, I don't know if confusing is the word or interesting how spiritual and abstract it can be and in the same time so concrete and grounded all this path it's it's really confusing or it needs time to think about it yeah i, I hear you <laughs> i hear you it is <laughs> well said yeah yeah and you know i think that looking back at yourself is a good good way to gather confidence in the path you know if you think all right well take something like compassion that we've liked the idea of for a long long time before we even knew how to meditate we liked the idea of compassion it was a primary focus in our lives and of course sometimes we forget and we get irritable and grumpy and we do the wrong thing but generally in our life compassion was has been important for a long time or you wouldn't do the work that you do right and you know probably even before you did the work that you do compassion was important to you because it occurred to you to do this work right so it's been like a refuge compassion has been a refuge and it's been an inner refuge and an outer refuge. A lot of your development happened because other people were compassionate towards you. A lot of transformation happened because you were receptive to the compassion of others. But there was also a compassion within you that could hear it, you know? There had to be kind of two receptor sites and there had to be a back and a forth and there had to be that process happening. And, you know, that might not have been something you ever articulated to yourself or trained in. It just kind of happened experientially, organically over time. It might have been something that you studied in different forms. But now, concentrating on developing it as a tool, not just something that you like or comes naturally, but something that's a tool to be honed, to be developed, is there a change in your compassion self and others having brought it into focus and made it more of an intentional project you know just even in a few years rather than it being an abstract idea or just something that was generally important bringing it into the forefront of your mind and coming back to it and coming back to it has there been a a, a deepening just even in a few years I'm guessing there has been. And, you know, if you don't see it in yourself, maybe you see it in your peers and you realize they're differently reactive, less reactive, a bit more forgiving, <laughs> a bit more accepting, a bit more kind, you know, that there's a shift that's happened because of having made it a training. And so when you look back on your own development, then the idea of these stages of development makes more sense. And you can have more confidence in them because you see that what you've been asked to practice, when you do practice it, it has an effect that's positive. Therefore, if I keep practicing, it's probably going to have the effect they describe. And even if it doesn't, is there any harm in trying because the process seems useful in and of itself? Even if I don't believe in the far goal, even if I don't believe in future lives, even if I don't believe in Buddhahood, some positive development is happening as a result of adopting these processes. So you just kind of treat it as a working experiment or a working hypothesis of, it might be true, let's see how it goes. Even if it's not, seems useful. Kind of an idea. Yeah, other, other thoughts? Yeah, I think that just, I just thought of how weird it is to combine like something so spiritual like compassion and training it's like so concrete and so I just had a, uh, a conversation with my uh, son he's 15 and I told him you know math you have to practice and he said not only math everything you learn you learn you have to practice and it was like hmm interesting <laughs> <laughs> a good grasshopper <laughs> exactly and, and this is what can free up possibilities because if you think it has to come naturally, then if it doesn't, you're stuck. 
right? If you think everything is a learning, then no problem. You just keep practicing and you'll figure it out. Just keep practicing, just keep practicing. It'll, it'll get easier, it'll get smoother. The problem with a lot of our stuff is thinking that it should just come naturally, you know? Or something like love is so profound, something like compassion is so profound. I just have it within me, just naturally. Why can't I get to it? Why doesn't it come out when I want it to? What's wrong with me? And it's just, well, you haven't trained in it enough. Don't worry about it. You've got some, <laughs> right? You've got some. No worries. Yeah, so this is um, the right way to think about these things, is to think of them as, as trainings and learnings and tools. But it is, it is odd for us, because these are sort of things that are natural to human beings and not natural to human beings. <laughs> you know, there are things that we already know and value but they're also things that don't come up as often or as consistently as we would like them to. Yeah. So what makes them come up more? Think about them more on purpose, with intention, in different angles and different times, just again and again. You know, you, you've heard this before, but you know, meditation in Tibetan, the word is gom, like gompa, gom, and it just means to familiarize. Yeah, it sounds like meditation should be this magical, mystical experience, and it just means repeat it, <laughs> right? What you've understood, what you know how to do, do it again, <laughs> and do it again. Yeah, gom. So gompa is like the meditation place, the familiarization place, even though it means, you know, a place of seclusion. What you're separating yourself from is the old habits. Retreat is retreating from negative states of mind and the patterns that bring them out most habitually. And so you do that by physically shifting space and you do that by physically changing your schedule. But what you're really retreating from is your neuroses and your negative habits to build a new strength to take out then with you into your old structures. So retreat really is like rehab, right? It's samsara rehab. Yeah, any yeah, other questions about um, the five paths or about these analogies? This will be the, the end of the analogies talk. So, um, so if you've got thoughts about them, now's the time. I have a little um, summary of the analogies from um, Geshe Lodin. This book is called um, The Fundamental Potential for Enlightenment. And it's not available as an ebook, unfortunately. You have to get it a hard copy but it's by um, Geshe Lodin. And um, if you like, I can take a picture of the cover and send it to you. But it's basically a commentary on the sublime continuum of, of Maitreya. So rather than like our course materials, which just take little excerpts, this is the whole commentary to the whole text by Maitreya. So it's, it's a lovely book. And Geshe Lodin was um, a Geshe that lived in Melbourne, Australia, and taught Westerners for many, many years before he died. and. Um, his organization, the Tibetan Buddhist Society, is, is a really amazing organization. And they have maybe six little publications that are all just really beautifully translated and really accessible. So um, the summary he's given for these, um, I'll just read it to you. Number one, attachment obscures the Buddha potential as the ugly lotus petals obscure the Buddha statue sitting within. Hatred obscures the Buddha potential as a swarm of bees obscures the honey in their midst. Ignorance obscures the Buddha potential as a husk obscures the grain within. Violent outbursts of the three poisons obscure the Buddha potential as filth obscures the gold it covers. The latencies of ignorance obscure the Buddha potential as the ground obscures the precious treasure hidden beneath. The objects of abandonment of the Hinayana path of seeing obscure the Buddha potential as a seed obscures the potential sprout that is abiding within. The objects of abandonment of the Hinayana path of meditation obscure the Buddha potential as the tattered cloth obscures the golden image of the Buddha wrapped within. The objects of abandonment of the seven impure grounds obscure the Buddha potential, as the poor woman's womb obscures her baby with the potential to be a universal king. 
The objects of abandonment of the three pure grounds obscure the Buddha potential as the clay mold obscures the golden image of the Buddha. So like that. Okay, so the point of all of this is the mess is okay. <laughs> it's not gonna ruin the purity, right? Transformation is always possible. It always has been possible. It always will be possible in yourself, in all sentient beings, even your hardest client, even your most obnoxious relative. There is always at the center of it, the potentiality that will never be ruined. So, you know, don't get distracted by the bees. <laughs> don't get distracted by the lotus. Remember that it's always concealing health. There's, you know, and the potential for health, mental health, physical health. Um, I made you a meditation um, of the nine analogies that we did on Monday. I made you it uh, with video um, just because. <laughs> and so um, it's uploading and it should be up at the end of the day. So I'll send it to you at the end of the day together. All right, so just take a minute and come back to your center. And just feel like you can touch into the center of your heart chakra. That's the seat of your fundamental mind. And that heart center, seat of your mind, is completely full of Buddha potential, transformation ability, as well as some natural peace, natural spaciousness. And so just sit with it, uh, thinking to bring it into the rest of your day. And as you connect with the Buddha potential, imagine that by connecting with it, it encourages others to connect with theirs. And all of this leads to the development of freeing oneself from suffering, developing stable happiness. Thanks guys, see you Monday.